Ladies and gentlemen, celebrating five years as a podcaster, introducing Nate the Great! You are now tuned in! Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to a special edition of the Game Changer Podcast. I am Nate the Effing Great, your host, the Paladin of Positivity. And why is it so special, you might be asking? Well, it's not for me promoting a lot of things that are going on in the world as far as my end goes, but we do have a special guest here. Last time around, we had Victory Bell make her triumphant return to the GCP, and she will be on future episodes. If you've not listened to our show, definitely check it out, where we talk about the Mulan live-action remake, as I crink my neck in disgust, as well as Wonder Woman 84. Definitely great reviews on that. Check that out. But we have another former co-host of the Game Changer podcast and gracing us from the Wrestle Attic Radio Network. He is the head liaison in Canada. He is the creator of Fretzelmania's podcast. Definitely check that out. Absolutely wonderful content. He is the one, the only, now we have to call him the shiny-headed Mr. Fretz. Shiny-head Kyle, eat your heart out. We're the Kyles. Oh, man, it's so good to see you again, my friend, my good brother. It's good to be uh, back on a video call and uh, talking some wrestling and other stuff possibly with you. How you been, bro? I have been pretty good, man. I've just been keeping my sanity during this whole pandemic deal now with everything that's going on with the you know uh injection injections not the vaccines there we go gotta make it sound less painful than that uh everything that's going on with vaccines it seems like some things are starting to get back to normal but there's still the tendency of people being really really uh what's the phrase i'm looking for oh yeah stupid you know Stupid idiots that make the list. Yeah, I, I mean, stupid idiots is literally like one of my favorite words going into just the entirety of this. Uh, other than that, uh, Karens are being utilized and just dummies that don't know how to wear masks. You know, that kind of deal. Yeah, completely feel you, bro. <laughs> but how's it going on your end, man? I'm working like a... Uh, in the words of Homer Simpson, I'm working like a Japanese beaver. <laughs> uh, I, I'm doing the grocery thing, working with my bro, uh, you know, seeing, seeing him lots. Uh, I just spent last night watching the Super Bowl and playing Mario Kart with him and the kids. And, yeah, just just working loads, put, putting in the hours, and doing some good stuff. Yeah, so... Shout out to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers for winning their second Super Bowl uh, and Tom Brady for winning his seventh, which, you know, I say, who cares? Now it's another situation where Tom Brady gets to brag for a full another year and we are basically going through a hell that is not pandemic related. Excuse me. I mean, hey, it's it's probably a payoff deal. It's probably a bigger payoff than, oh gosh, I'm trying to think of a good wrestling example. Like, uh, Jeez, what was it like? There, there was like one person that was bad bunny. Oh, there we go. There we go. That, that is the most recent one at this point. <laughs> but yeah, I think I knew like right around the third corner when I turned it, when I tuned in. I just saw the score and I'm like, yeah, this is not going to happen. As soon as they scored another touchdown, it's like, yeah, Chiefs, you are, you're done. You, you are done. Time to go home. Time to pack it in. I watched them win one last year. I'm happy. Uh, I know um, our good brother over in England, Jermaine, he's probably about as heartbroken as I am. But, hey, we, we saw Kansas City won last year. You know, I've seen the Blue Jays win a championship. I've seen the Raptors win one. Manchester United, Kansas City Chiefs, there's one to go. And it's this blue and white maple leaf behind me. So, <laughs> uh, fingers crossed. They won tonight just as we were starting to record here. They won 3-1 to one in... Uh, against Vancouver for the third time in a row they have been killing the Vancouver Canucks sorry Larry uh Larry Larry so speaking of bad things that involve sports uh 
that is not something that we could talk about when we mentioned the Royal Rumble. Because in all honesty, from what I tuned into, I tuned in just enough to re- meet the um, Women's Rumble match. Then I got the chance to see the Universal title match and then the uh, Men's Rumble match, which, to be honest, all three were pretty damn good, to be honest. I know that I didn't get a chance to see a lot of the previous stuff. I haven't gotten a chance to walk back at, watch that stuff back. Uh, I actually spent some parts of the day watching a lot of the rise of Kofi Mania from a couple years ago. That was some good stuff. That was just... mm, That was actually really good. Unintentional storytelling, but still good storytelling nonetheless. Better storytelling than the Women's Tag Team Championship match, I'll say that. Uh, Yeah, they have... Those titles have literally been screwed ever since day one. I mean, I'm not saying, you know, anything bad against Sasha and Bailey. It's just ever since they were incarnated, we knew that it was just not going to be built to last. Because I, even when you look at the incarnation of it, they had six teams at the start of the whole thing. And now they're dwindled down to like maybe three, if there, if even. Oh, yeah. yeah I think uh, the Bellas might be squaring up for an in-ring return. And now they're just throwing poo at the wall and seeing what random tag teams stick uh this time uh if you get this reference big can of coke to you but there's mandy and what's her name dana brooke (laughs) i'm calling them the the jumping blonde angels (laughs) now if you get that reference anyone who's listening to this big can of ipa to you because that's what i'm drinking tonight but (laughs) yeah it's 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 nothing. I mean, it's it's like the men's tag team division. That's even more sad, considering the men's tag team division has been going on for decades, and now they're the same thing. They're dwindled down to only like a couple handful of tag teams, and one of those teams are champions, which are Bobby Roode and Dolph Ziggler. I hate everything. I I hate so many things in this world, and that is one of them because Dolph Ziggler is a phenomenal talent, and Bobby Roode. We already know how glorious of an entrance he can have, but also how amazing he can have. Go watch a lot of his stuff on NXT. It's absolutely amazing, especially his stuff with Roderick Strong, Nakamura, Kenta, even though one of my good friend, Agent Cooper, would disagree with that because Bobby Roode kicked out of the GTS. Well, technically didn't kick out of it. He just put his foot on the rope. That that, that, that still counts. And and lest us not not forget his TNA run, of which I did I did not see anything from Beer Money. I wasn't watching TNA at the time, but me being a Canadian, of course I'm going to be a big Team Canada mark. So you had him and Eric Young as the tag champs. The I loved the storyline where Bobby Roode was looking for a manager, and he had all these people in his limo. Like God rest his soul, he had Bobby freaking Heenan, who we all knew he wasn't going to be there because he was. Well, he was just starting his cancer treatments back then, and you had everyone from Jimmy Hart to Bobby Heenan, and yeah, the dirt and they're the Dirty Dogs, and it's D A W G S. Is this nineteen ninety nine? I mean, ugh. at least New Day and Retribution. Like I was just watching a little bit of Raw. They're in a feud. You can put the titles on, on that, but. Speaking of Kofi Mania, we're going to full circle take a shot for Kofi Mania versus Ali Mania. Mm. They're, mm. And they're bringing that into the equation, which makes it... I think it makes it a little interesting, although it's one year too late, but given the fact we had uh, COVID Mania last year in the MTPC, now they want to do so many fans at Raymond James, because there was, what, 20,000 there for the Super Bowl? Yeah. Vince wants to do the same things i think what they were doing is yeah we're gonna have two nights of mania at at raymond james which awesome i'll book both those nights off i'll watch it uh they wanted to see what the super bowl did and they had a bunch of cardboard cutouts so i would like to see a mix of thunderdome and (laughs) normal fans because i'll i'll tune into that i will try to get into the thunderdome for that i couldn't get on for the rumble but whatever (laughs) The Mania Dome, might as well call it at that point. But yeah, honestly, with the two Rumble matches, I was pretty happy with the results. Um, People are complaining about the fact that Bianca's feet hit first instead of Rhea Ripley. It's like, just grow up. There have been 
worst botches that have happened in Rumble history. And I'm not going to let that, you know, take away from Bianca's, you know, Rumble victory, which in all honesty, I was not expecting it. It's one of those few times where it's like Bianca won. Oh, B- B- Bianca won. Okay. I'm, I am totally okay with this. I'm fine with her, you know, you know, headlining WrestleMania. If they really want to push her, this is the proper way to do it. Uh, she has definitely earned the right to get that spot. And the other one, of course, being Adam Copeland, a.k.a. Edge. And, of course, there are people that complain, like, oh, this old part-timer, he doesn't deserve to win the Rumble. It's like, okay, a few years ago we were complaining about that with Batista. We complain about this other stuff. But when Sting joins AEW, it's like, oh, Sting's here. Yay, everything's fine and dandy. Then Edge wins, and it's like Goldberg fiend all over again. It's like, no, it's not. Edge is there to make people look good. He's not there to bury anybody. If he wins, it's probably out of his control. I say probably because there's some people that might actually bring up a good point as to why Edge should win the title. But, like I said, it's just one of those things where I'm not taking away from him. He started out at number one, a very pristine spot in which they literally have had very few in between people win that spot. He won, and it was great. It was a great moment. And it was great storytelling, too, because this time last year, which was Edge's triumphant return. And as soon as I saw, you know, remember that, I remember the video that you had that wound up on his freaking 24, (laughs) Uh, which is awesome. I'm trying, I'm now I'm trying to get, (laughs) I'm trying to get on the network now. Like Kings of the Rings is on there somewhere and you're on there now. Like, okay, that's, it's my turn. I'm going to, I did one for Christian's return because I was not expecting that I, dam- I actually damn near cried for that one it was so so good and, and if we can circle back to the women's rumble and dissect that a little bit i gotta say the mvp of of that billy k <laughs> <laughs> like i did not think billy k would turn this chicken shit into chicken salad like she's out handing resumes on, on the back of an eight by ten by the way that is why did why didn't anybody ever think of that when applying it to like McDonald's and Wendy's? Here's a selfie with my qualifications on the back. <laughs> um, like everyone, okay, who, who was it? Like Shayna Baszler just punched, like freaking punched the selfie, and then finally, Jillian Hall. <laughs> I, I, I was pissed she didn't come out with a big freaking thing on her face. I'm like, oh wait, Boogeyman ate that. So uh, <laughs> they would have to go through some pretty disgusting means to uh, retrieve that. But then they do Billy and Jilly. And I loved the thing with her being conflicted in the ring with uh, Ruby Riot and Peyton Royce. Like I thought we were going to get like an iconic kind of pose for a sec, but I think we were robbed of that. Your buddy Victoria, <laughs> my lord, she looked good, but her elimination, are you, Victoria, if you're hearing this, are you okay? That elimination looked stiff. Uh, my, I picked, if you listen to the show, I picked Bailey to win, and I've come full circle on Bianca. I used to absolutely despise her because, like, what's this chick whipping people with her, her hair for? The only thing now, the only way I want to see Bianca whip people with her hair is you book her in a hardcore match. <laughs> and, you know, I think back in, um, excuse me, Roman times, when they had the whip with like little claws on them, the cat or nine tails. In Roman times. I thought you were talking like in Roman Reigns times. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, 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 not in... Uh, Hit, not, not his time. So we'll, we'll talk about his match too here in a second. But oh, yeah, back in the old times when you get the cat and nine tails, the little claws at the end yeah. of the, the whip. That's what I want to see out of Bianca Belair. Get like, have a hardcore feud with Ray or Ripley or something over the women's title eventually. Because Sasha versus Bianca, the promos alone, mwah, I can I can smell them from here. They're going to be so good. But it's baby face versus baby face. They're both good at being natural heels or natural baby faces. That's that's this the strength with this feud, and it's so intriguing. Yeah, we haven't seen anyone make a decision yet. 
frankly, I don't think they should make a decision until like a month or, or so before Mania to give us a little bit of intrigue. Edge came to NXT. He stood face to face with um, Karrion Cross, and I changed my pants. <laughs> <laughs> he stood he stood face to face with Finn Balor once again. Pants changed. We're, we know we're not getting that. I just love the tease. It's so good. But man, the who who, who what other surprises? We had Casey Catanzaro doing that elimination where she did the splits. Landed right on her crotch and yeeted out. Looked extremely painful. Unfortunately, we were robbed of Mia Yim, aka Reckoning, in this as her and Keith Lee were uh, COVID. And who, who, I'm trying to think what other surprises came out in the women's rumble. The, the only big ones that came out for the men's, and we'll talk about that too. But it was thoroughly entertaining. It was uh, it breezed by because these shows are short now. I'm loving it. Yeah. It's really amazing seeing how this Rumble, uh, you know, comparing the one from last year to this year, and despite not having, you know, as many fans as they did uh, last year, uh, well, if any fans, really, it's still one of those things where it is something I'll give WWE credit to. They still created a good quality show that definitely delivered, and both Rumble's matches, they're always going to deliver, in our opinions, and they definitely did. Yeah, fantastic stuff. I'm we're trying to think what else was on the show. Oh, freaking Sasha Banks and Carmel. Reginald, we gotta talk about the sommelier. First off, what the hell is a sommelier? I still, I still don't know what it is, like a wine taster or something. And I find something funny with Mela is most of the heels on WWE have a bit of in their entrance theme, Bailey, Seth Rollins, Mella. I mean, Opera is heel. Apparently. Yeah. And <laughs> I loved how Reggie got kicked out. Like, he caught Sasha Banks. Like, basically saved her life and then maybe just put her down. And then they're like, you're out of here. He would have came in handy because, uh, Carmella did a suicide dive and landed right on her face. Like, Ouch. that's like, I'm surprised she's walking after that. That was a scary freaking bump. That's the kind of thing that people criticize Sasha Banks. Remember when people called Sasha Banks like Bacha Banks? Yeah, I did. I got, I got vibes from that. Well, for one thing, Sasha Carmella, they put on a damn good match. They have improved 60 fold in the ring. And they put on a good show. Um, did you get to watch Roman versus Kevin? That matchup, I am very thoroughly happy with until we reach a certain point. Uh, I liked the fact that they were fighting all around the arena. The fact that they were not just doing the stuff in the ring. That they got to do some backstage stuff, including one that people are saying, like, oh, they ripped off AEW. It's like, you're, you're going to rip off somebody no matter what, so just shut up. They was... ripped off WrestleMania 17. <laughs> they did. The hardcore, one of my favorite matches of all time, and I kid you not, the hardcore title match from WrestleMania X7, Raven, Big Show, Kane. I watch it, like, ten times a year, still. It's one of those things where, you know, that Swanton Bomb or the Senton Bomb, whatever you want to call it for Kevin Owens. Jeez. It was it was a good spot. It really was. I honestly was thinking that he was just gonna have the forklift pin Roman down and that's how he was gonna win. I'd be like, oh my god I would have been like, oh my god, that'd be like rocking mankind. That'd have been amazing. It's, it's one of those things where it's like, oh my gosh, that's that's brilliant. Why did, has nobody thought of this before? Nope. Okay, well, we somebody needs to do that for a future last man standing matchup because I would do it. I would literally just find a forklift, put it on him, and just be like, "Yeah, nineteen ninety nine, bitch." <laughs> that that would take the uh, the tractor tire thing to a whole new level. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but um, yeah, the finish is where they lost me. I understand uh, where they were coming from. However, the problem was the fact that they botched it. 
and botched it hard. So let's paint you guys a picture as to what happens. Roman Reigns is trying to handcuff Kevin Owens to the, I think it was one of the uh, lighting units that were all over by the, uh, th over in the Thunderdome. Kevin Owens, being smart, decides to change it up. He decides to just literally switch it around where Roman Reigns is the one that's handcuffed on there. It's like, oh my gosh, Kevin Owens is going to win. Kevin Owens is going to win. Just as they reach nine, Roman Reigns grabs the referee and just chucks him into the beam, which I thought, that's smart. That is smart. That's really good. Okay, this is not a problem. Here's where the issue happened. We see, for some reason, Paul Heyman come out to try and unlock the handcuffs. Referee is still counting. And then for some reason... He stops because apparently they screwed up that handcuff spot. They were taking too long. It didn't work out. And people were just saying, like, why should why did it stop? Why couldn't they have just, you know, continue counting? Blah, blah. And I would agree. If it was one of those things where if they had to continue counting on it, I would have just given Kevin Owens the win and then just have him immediately drop it to Roman the following night. It could be one of those things where, you know, maybe people could make it seem like, was that a botch? Was that a was that a mix up? Sure, they could reveal it like months later, but at the same time, you're going to give Kevin Owens his win that he finally earned because he never got a rematch for the title in the first place or a second run at least. He had a couple of matches with Roman though. He had a really good steel cage one on uh, New Year's Day actually, and then got his other shot at the Rumble. I thought he was hurt. Like, uh, oh, it was. I think it was on Kings of the Rings weeks and weeks ago that Ricky was saying that he has Kevin Owens has bruised kidneys and this and that. So that, I imagine that would have been their his kayfabe injuries here. And speaking of kayfabe, yeah, they really kept that alive by not counting that taking out the referee and just yeeting him into the pole was hilarious and smart. And I got to give Paulie credit here. I mean, despite the fact it was kind of a botch on his part, uh, handcuff keys are a bitch. <laughs> like like they're uh they're small and they're awkward and like little prongs and getting in there and getting in the right angle and shit it's it's like when you have a broken or frozen like key to your house it's uh, it's it's a bitch so i'll i'll give them credit for rolling with it but just just to awkwardly stop counting the camera's still right there on you Oh, man, yeah, that was heavily featured on Botchamania. Matthew had a field day with that one. <laughs> oh, man, but it was a very good creative match. Like, the golf cart, <laughs> unintentional comedy of just coming out of nowhere, just to plow in the cabinet. He jumped in time because if he miscued that, he would have got severely injured, like, bad. Uh Going into the backup ring or the warm-up ring was a really cool touch. The Once they brought out the forklifts and then Kevin Owens was playing with heights, I'm just like, dude, you have a child. Be careful, please. <laughs> uh, Roman Reigns just taking everything and Man, he's the master of trash talk. Where has this Roman... I'm rooting for Roman Reigns now. And those who know me... I didn't root for him for a long time. I think it took up until right before his diagnosis. And I, I credit Ant for helping me become a Roman fan because I was those guys in the crowd doing like the John Cena sucks, the Roman sucks, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't come to appreciate anything until later. John Cena's U.S. Open Challenge opened my eyes. Uh, Roman Reigns, I think when Roman was going for the title at SummerSlam in Brooklyn, and he won, and of course listening to Rant with Ant leading up to that, that helped. And knowing he's a cancer survivor, you know, like many people I know, like my father, and awesome. no, wait, no, no, that person, anyways, that's, that's besides the point, it's cool to like Roman, I guess, and I'm intrigued to see what his... Um, reaction is going to be when there are actual crowds it's probably going to be a mixture of cheers for the people that like the bad guy and also booze because the kids are going to be like you're not supporting us anymore we don't want to buy your action figures you know the it's really weird because i had a discussion with a couple friends of mine we have like our own little private group on facebook 
And one of the things that they were asking was these whole, you know, behind the scenes deals, which trust me, we're going to talk about a big one in just a minute. Uh, are they kind of hurting the business? And it's kind of one of those things where I made the case that, you know, kayfabe is really dead. There's really no reason for people to continue the charade of, you know, thinking that, oh, if these people hate each other on the screen, they have to hate each other in real life. No, it's we're past that point. People have been up in arms, and Vince McMahon especially has been doing this for years, that, you know, if somebody does like a no-no because they're doing something different on screen, they're going to either get heat, they're going to get punished, or they're just probably going to get fired. I mean, the whole thing with Braun Strowman and Roman Reigns years ago, they were literally just almost literally trying to kill each other, and then next thing you know, on Instagram, Braun and Roman are just like buddy-buddy in like Italy or something like that. Apparently that's a no-no. The whole thing with uh, Lana Rusev, Dolph Ziggler, and Summer Rae years ago was another thing that I brought oh, up. God. Yes, it was a rubbish storyline, but it's one of those things where, you know, did Lana and Rusev deserve to get punished for, you know, announcing their engagement? No, they didn't because they, they're human beings. They deserve to be happy. Now, granted, maybe they could have done it a little bit more secret to kind of, you know, not have WWE react the way they did. But that's just that's just my opinion on that. So it's one of those things where it's not hurting the business. I think that it does still open the eyes and remind us that everybody is still a human being. They're just like you and me. It's just one of those things where I don't have a big deal about it. I know there's other people that have mentioned that, you know, you can go behind the scenes, but there does come to a point where it gets to be too much. I think kayfabe died the day that Iron Sheik and Hot Hacksaw Jim Duggan got pulled over. <laughs> <laughs> if I can be completely honest, and, and, and that's a dated reference. Uh, be, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm showing my age here, but yeah, it's it's always there. And I, it was funny. I was listening to uh, Tom Campbell um, deliver the news for What Culture walking home tonight, and it was Father James Mitchell doing the wedding for Penelope Ford and Kip Sabian, and he said something about in the name of Kay Fabe and. Tony Khan, like, okay, that's funny. <laughs> and if you watch <laughs> old WWE shit from the eighties, like the, you know, the stand back music video, credits, K, Fabe. So it's always there. You have guys that I respect with everything in me, and <laughs> MJF. He is the ultimate keeper of kayfabe. I mean, he can go to a freaking cancer ward and be a dickhole, <laughs> and it would, and everyone would still, well, hate him. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's out there. But the yeah, they, they could have done something with the keys, and ro- you would have had to create tension with Roman and Paul, and that's something I don't want to see yet because I think Roman should stay the dominant heel on and off as champion until we eventually get to WrestleMania with The Rock, and that's not for another couple of years. Yeah, I definitely do see that happening more in the Hollywood time, but that is something that we can definitely discuss at a later time. But one thing we definitely wanted to discuss was the WWE icons documentary that just came out the first episode they actually do have a few other episodes that are going to be coming out later on during the year talking about uh, beth phoenix lex luger rob van dam among others but the first episode was talking about the late great yoko zuna my god this was a bit of an interesting documentary because i think somebody actually made the case that it was kind of like WWE's version of Dark Side of the Ring, which I could see where they get that, but there's no, there's no replicating Dark Sides of the Ring. There really isn't. I'm sorry, but especially after you and I talked about that Owen Hart episode, no, 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 no documentary is going to be able to touch Dark Side of the Rings. I don't care what anybody says, but this one was still very emotional because it did talk about uh, Yokozuna's, you know, humble beginnings. They did talk about the. Uh, Samoan family, the heritage that they had. It's just absolutely just amazing going through everybody and how, you know, they're related to whom and everything like that. It, this is the Samoan family tree. Just 
my God. And the presence that they've had in wrestling is just absolutely insurmountably, unequivocally, and undeniable. It's just so vast just seeing that. The thing was that he started off as just this big giant, giant guy that would go out and kick people's asses. He was literally, literally that guy. And he was actually booked to be the filler in for Rikishi when they, in the early, not nine, early eight, uh, late eighties, early nineties. There we go. Where they were t- talking about the head shrinkers and she, he was going to be filling in for that, but they just couldn't find the time to really get him in. They couldn't find a way to work him in. And then it wasn't until Sergeant Slaughter that came up with the idea and said, what if we made him like a sumo wrestler? What if we made him like Japanese? And it was off to the races. He became Yokozuna. He became this gargantuan, just monster heel that still could work like no other could. And it just was absolutely amazing just to see him, you know, work in the ring for a guy of his stature. I think they even had so many people like uh, Mark Henry was one of the guys that I remember them talking to that was saying like, you know, he was kind of one of the guys that paved the way for bigger guys to, you know, get in the ring. And he's right. It's one of those things where I look back and I think, forget that there are so many people that were of that stature and that had that big, huge presence there. And did they, you know, do flips and stuff like that? No, they were there to literally be in a brick wall and they got over for it. Yeah, he, he was that dominant, one of the first dominant big heels. I'm talking like bigger, um, kind of like Andre, but for the for the majority of his career, Andre worked babyface. So you had this dominant heel who just tore through everyone, had a big run with the title, beat the big dog that runs the yard, Hulk Hogan, for the belt. The lesser we say about WrestleMania 9 and the end of that show, the better. I will do want to but say yeah, one I thing. Think. I do want to say one thing about that is that we yes. do have a confirmation that Hulk Hogan himself did say that he kind of threw the idea in there that he should go over on Yokozuna. And from what Bruce Pritchard said, the reason why they initially decided to go with that was because they had those international tours that were going to be happening and they wanted to have Yoko versus Hulk Hogan during that time, which funny enough, I actually listened to an episode of A Solo Monster. Hulk wasn't really on those international tours. He didn't really do too much until the King of the Ring events that happened, like, months later. So it was kind of one of those things where it's like, so basically what you're saying is that this uh, quick title change was all BS and it was all for naught. Yeah, pretty much. Great. Just just great. Now, with the benefit of hindsight and... Uh... I listen to the Cultaholic Classic Raw Review every week with Tom Campbell, and if you thought I was a wrestling historian, listen to Justin Henry. I mean, he writes a lot of scripts for your Cultaholic, um, was it uh, from the Vault videos? He writes those scripts. That that man puts me to shame <laughs> big time, but now that they're into 1995, I've, I've listened all the way up. So in 93, Hulk was on maybe a couple of Raws in the tail end of that tour. So he didn't really work with Yoko that much. They wanted to do like Hogan Andre. They wanted to create that magic, but it's not there. They tried like Lex Luger and Yoko, which we got later that year, was the closest thing that came to replicating that because you always wanted the big guy getting slammed um, you wanted someone to slam the big like slam the big show who did that like Kane okay uh, who slammed big John Stud? like Andre the Giant who slammed Andre you wanted what they wanted to do is recreate those moments and he just couldn't do it y- Yoko was the perfect opponent for that and he was the perfect dominant fixture uh, I used to get <laughs> this is around the time I was starting to casually watch wrestling when Yokozuna came out so I got called Yokozuna by my by my own friends in elementary school because I've always been a a bigger person. Like I got pushed into my, I don't I, I, don't ask me how this works, but I got pushed onto my friend, accidentally giving him a bonsai drop from another friend. Then he blamed me, calling me a fucking Yokozuna. <laughs> oh, and, and this geez. is like fourth grade, and it, and I'm still talking about it today, and I'm still friends with these people, like. 
we recently reconnected because, you know, uh, Double J just had a kid. Shout out, Double J. I hope you're doing well, bud. Um, yeah, it's – and it was just so cool to see how he came from Coquina Maximus, which could have been – he could have had the Head Trickers as a stable. And I'm glad they didn't go that route because Yokozuna – was I, I think it was a perfect fit for him, f- for Rodney. For the first while, it was damn good. Yeah, and as time went on, we did we see kind of like you know the sort of the, the the fall of Yokozuna slowly start to happen. Uh, some might say that it happened during like WrestleMania ten because he had a battle against Luger and Brett's that moment where he kind of slipped doing the bonsai drop and then Brett pinned him one, two, three after that. Um, then after that, he really didn't get too much in the way of his win back as a main eventer. He started doing his uh, tag team run with Owen Hart. And one of the reasons why WWE decided to do that because Yoko was definitely getting winded and he was, he was getting, a, he was gaining a lot of weight and they tried so hard to get him on, you know, a healthy diet, healthier diet. They tried to get him, get him fit. This was something that scares me: is that they actually had him go to the back, and they had to go through a a forklift weighing machine. They had to use that to weigh him. That was something that's not only terrifying, but I also understand, you know, why it seems insulting. But at the same time, you can only do so much with. A regular scale and to be honest there could only so much that you can do when you're as big as he and this is a, and this is a guy who loved to eat they t- told a story about how they did had a restaurant and it was almost like this big giant plate of food plate of food that would s- served like 20 people he did that all in one serving he was that <laughs> he was happened on having food so it was something that was definitely a detriment to him, was his weight, and it definitely started to weigh him down, no pun intended, immensely as his career went on. Yeah, it was just unfortunate to see. And you hear stories about how, well, you had to make him go to the bathroom in a bucket because there was a story about uh, like a toilet collapsing under him like i think andre went through went through the same thing where it got to the point where you had to like relieve yourself in front of a curtain in like a in the trash can and it's not only is it humiliating it's just it's sad and you know being a bigger fellow myself like i'm i'm still trying to get my diet right i looked in my fridge and i'm out of vegetables and i was actually sad about it yeah you you get me my age and you're sad you're out of vegetables yeah, yikes. Um, <laughs> so I wanted some with my chicken wings tonight. But yeah, it's it, it's also eye-opening as well. As I'm like, I don't want to get to that point. Because be, if I were to get over like that much weight at five foot five, I mean, if you're a big believer in the body mass index, which I'm not, I think it's a crock of shit. And this is a totally different conversation for a totally different time. <laughs> but man, it's just so crazy how he got from this point to the other like look at his early work as coquina he's maybe 350 pounds maybe 400 by the time he got to the w by the time he got the world title he was just a hair over 500 at the end of his wwe run in survivor series 96 which was his last appearance with the company he was like 675 pounds and that's in four years I mean I know it's like some people have that in their DNA like look at Rikishi now he's he's pretty big himself but man a lot of those Samoan guys are pretty big now that I think of it uh, Usos what, what, what's your diet let me know what your secrets are <laughs> uh, yikes it's, it, it's, it's, it's it's kind of a, a cautionary tale in a way, is is is, is Yoko Azuna because he was thirty two when he passed away. He was trying on and off, but the you know the story about we got sent to the fat camp. Yeah, I think I heard that. Yeah, I think it was him and Vader actually, and someone on the inside 
would sneak buckets of chicken to him to the fat camp. Then you'd get sent in the fat camp, and you'd come back, and you're even bigger. And Brucey e. P is just like, because I've heard his podcast on Yokozuna, like, be, bewildered. How, how? We're trying, dude. We're trying here. Like, let's let's work with you, but he, you love food. <laughs> <laughs> you love chicken. <laughs> but one of the things I will say that loved hearing about Yokozuna was the fact that even though his health was definitely not at his best, his attitude always was. He definitely was one of those guys that very few people had anything horrible to say about him. There were so many people that wanted to work with him, especially during the early part. The Undertaker, Mark Calloway, he was one of those guys who was just absolutely wanting to work with Yokozuna. I mean, he worked with so many other people like, you know, uh, King Kong Bundy, Giant Gonzalez. But when it came to big guys, he literally was like, I want to work with that guy. I, I want to I I do that. I want to work with him. And... He's one of those guys who definitely knew how to switch, you know, professional and personal. Because when he was, you know, Yokozuna, he was Yokozuna. But at a flip flip of the switch, when he's with his family, he is, you know, he's Rodney. He is, he is the dad, loving husband. He is the, he is that guy. He is that guy. So to hear that kind of stuff is another just amazing thing to hear that, you know, there are people out there that, you know, they can look. They could play a certain role on camera, but then off camera, they turn out to be like the sweetest people that you will ever meet. Uh, absolutely. I, I loved hearing just, you know, not only BSK, but you had his own daughter. Spitting image of, of Rodney, by the way, just absolute image of him. And that, that's, what I lo- that's what I love seeing when it, stuff about wrestlers that we, we don't get to see on TV. You know, we don't see... You know, BSK, unless you count The Undertaker's farewell at Survivor Series. We don't see what these people are like as families, as as brothers, dads, uncles. And I, I love hearing those stories. I, I love hearing ribs, too, because Yokozuna was... I don't know if he was much of a river, but if he was hanging out with Owen Hart, you know he was he was doing some stuff. <laughs> like, like he, he, he might have thrown himself into the gauntlet here when... Owen Hart and Davey would, you know, go to Ahmed Johnson's hotel room, take a dump, and then turn up the heat all the way. So once you get in, you can just get the like the hot and the smell at the same time. It's like, huh, that's funny. I want to know what Yoko did. I want to know what Yoko did for ribs, if if he did any with Owen. But as I, as I said, when he got to be in the tag team champions with Owen, uh, he was winded. Like he couldn't go. That's why. I mean. That, they put him in a tag team with Crush before, before that. They had a match with the Head Shrinkers at King of the Ring 94. Uh, or where Owen Hart won, coincidentally. And that, that's when he was starting to go on the decline and then take time off. But he was part of making people some big stars, namely, you know, arguably Lex Luger. Like, go on that USS Intrepid. Who can slam Lex Luger? Crush came this close couldn't do it random army guy couldn't do it i figured they would have brought out henry o godwin to try because he's country strong nope who does it lex luger but do they make lex luger a star as a result of this no and that is another i'm glad they're doing a lex luger thing because i am very intrigued by it you know a lot of people have negative feelings towards lex today mostly because of well, the death of Elizabeth, you know that story. It's wait, did Elizabeth have a dark side of the ring? She did. She and Macho uh, Man had one. I think it was like the first episode of season one. I want to say that's right. So a lot of people I know have very negative feelings towards Lex, and I, I don't. I mean, he's a deeply religious man now. He's been been for a while but it's just so sad to see you get jacked up Lex Luger the new Hulk Hogan slamming Yoko now he's gonna fight to a wheelchair and the fact they didn't put the title on him at SummerSlam he could have traded back on Raw so yeah but back back to Rod here it was just as I said I, I said before it's a cautionary tale and it's 
it was so sad to see that decline because I was watching. And by the time he got forklifted off of Monday Night Raw by Big Van Vader, I was watching Raw Weekly and I'm just like, I was laughing. So I'm like, yeah, he's so big, he can't get taken out by by a stretcher. They use a forklift. And not being my age, I look at that and it's like, that's, it's sad. And that, and that forklift wasn't a kayfabe. <laughs> there wasn't enough people to freaking lift him. Yeah, it's just hard seeing that, you know, when he's slowly declining. But I think the fact that they kind of ended on the note that it seemed like he was at peace with his with his life. He knew that he was being a good father, good husband, good family member. I think that he knew that he accomplished so much in his life that it did feel like it was his time to go. Which still, even saying that to me is just hard because the guy was 36, if I'm not mistaken. He died way too young. And it could have it could have really been avoided had, you know, had he taken care of himself. But he left a legacy that can never be replicated, can't be duplicated. And it's one of those things where he definitely still, in my opinion, paved the way for so many people. Because, like I said, you don't have to be the, you know, spray tanned, six packed kind of deal. And think that you have to be a wrestler. No, you can be whatever body what you want as long as you're doing, you know, something right with you, with it. Then you're going to make an impact. You know, guys that are not, you know, that fit. Guys like Samoa Joe, Kevin Owens, Willie Mack. They're they're bigger guys. Mark Henry. These are bigger guys who still made an impact and who still to this day are, you know, trailing a legacy behind for so many other people. And I guarantee you, there's somebody out there that's looking at them and being like, you know, if they can do that, I think I can be a wrestler. I mean, who who of all people would have thought that a guy as big as Willie Mack would have <laughs> been able to do like a suicide dive as well as a freaking moonsault? Just, just amazing. Just absolutely amazing. But Yoko's in... A- a- AC Austin, man. Look, look at him. Oh, that's right. <laughs> um, but Yokozuna, Rodney is a guy who we definitely sorely miss in the wrestling world definitely he got his due when he got inducted into the wwe hall of fame years ago he was probably inducted into the wrestling hall of fame years even long before this so he's got the proper recognition he is definitely a legend and he is definitely a pioneer for wrestlers from present day and into the future not only for you know his family, but for you know your your big your bigger fellers like your Willie, like oh my God Willie Mac, just um, um he's a freaking amazing and him and uh, although AC Austin he's dropped like a hundred and something pounds he's looking fresh right now so yeah he's been paving the way like you know he was the head of the table for lack of a better term. I can only imagine if he was still with us today, and, and even people like Jamal and Rose, like Umaga and Rosie, how they would factor into Roman Reigns' head of the table thing. And I'm still waiting on Jimmy Uso, or Jay, which, whichever one's it. Which one are you? <laughs> is, is injured. It's... Yeah, it's it's really sad, but I, I, I loved Yoko. He was someone I, also, I always loved watching above booing even but man it's just what a what a legacy to have for such a short run because he was in the fed for under four years like 92 about october 92 like full time until early 96 on and off and then disappeared in the beginning of 97 I'll, i'll respect to him for that big time Definitely, definitely. So from there, uh, one more thing we'll talk about as far as wrestling goes, and then we're going to go into talking to about some pop culture stuff, because why not at this point? Um, definitely, I want to promote, promote this, because for those of you that may have been following my personal page on Facebook, as well as Twitter, definitely know that I've been trying to get back into wrestling again, and that has been blessed with the great people of the wrestling show down in Rockford, Illinois. 
And I've been promoting this like crazy. The fact that I got to main event my first show with the wrestling show. And that was a Texas death match between myself and Mikey. Definitely something that I will say this, that it was painful to do, obviously. But it was one of those things I can definitely look back and have a smile on my face saying that I enjoyed it. It was absolutely wonderful. Uh, you brought up one of the, the the main highlights of that was that um, one of the stories that were going on here was that uh, Mikey used a tire on me to kind of take me out of action for a while. So he's trying to use that tire. I take that little tire, toss it to the side, pick up a bigger tire, which looked like a bit like a tracker tire. It kind of felt more like a, oh gosh, what was it? I would almost I mean, say it's like a mini monster truck tire and put it on Mikey's leg so that way he couldn't stand up for that Texas death match, uh, last man standing rule, which I'm proud of that moment. That was something that I myself brought up the idea and I thought, you know, it's going to be almost like Cena and Batista, only not as kooky or cheesy with, you know, duct tape, but it still worked. And why nobody really thought of that before is beyond me. Why nobody thought about a forklift in a last man staying match is beyond me. But now it's one of those things where it's like, I want to get a forklift now, just so that when I have a last man standing match, I can be like, Hey, I did this first. <laughs> nobody else can claim it. That's funny. That's like, I, I would use like the, you know, those, if, okay, this is my, this is going to be grocery, uh, grocery warehouse speaking here, but you know when you have to get something that's in these giant racks, so you have to get the big lifter. You know, oh like, yeah, yeah. Get it's like if I was if I was at work today, and if I did this because I was I was cashier today because I was filling in for people. But if I had to go to the top shelf and get like a whole pallet full of toilet paper, yeah, bring that down, and I'll pin you with that. Or the yeah, the, the, the duct tape thing was funny, but that really reminded me of. Um, of the of the rock, <laughs> like the, the the rock, and even with the little camera, I'm um, coming down on the pal. The rock's just like, no, no, no. That's it. That's some creative stuff there. Like I, I, I didn't watch the first match. I was like, I wanted to see my dude here. I wanted to see Nate's match, and and I love like just it's like the count of nine. Like fuck, just kidding, you <laughs> bird. and your promo, like yeah. I, I, I want to see the dark side of Nate. I've seen a little bit of it with Discrim and Nate. And, and the Texas death matches were my, I think one of the last shows we reviewed well, on, on the WrestleMania radio side of things was a Texas death match oh. between Mick, Mick Foley and, and Big Van Vader, which was amazing. Hells yeah. I do remember that now. Holy shit. That was, that was one heck of a matchup. Oh, gosh, I absolutely loved it. Um, oh man, I forgot. About, I, I actually did forgot about that other other side. Discriminate, just me, just literally not giving a shit about what anybody had to say. Give it vo- voicing my opinion, not caring about opinions. Just being like, this is what how I feel about it. Nobody's going to change my mind. I guarantee it. I may have to start doing. I may have to bring that back. That was that's an awesome one. Damn it. <laughs> Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. I actually forgot about discriminate. <laughs> That's right up there with the short-lived segment, but which I mean, I think it was only for one week. Uh, Corey Graves' electric chair. Like, they stopped. They didn't do because Sammy Zayn mentioned AEW. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of, we have to talk about Sammy Zayn here. Like the friggin' walking Bernie Sanders meme. Doing the first off, handcuffing himself to the ring. And then doing the Bernie Sanders thing with the mittens and the mask was funny enough as it is. But he is the best. I think he's the best heel, at least on SmackDown right now, because he's all about conspiracy theories. And here, I don't believe many conspiracy theories. I love a good one. Um, <clears throat> I agree with some. I'll tell you which one's off air. I don't want to turn this into a Jesse Ventura special. <laughs> but he is just so good at playing that. I'm getting screwed over, Dick. And the fact that it's he's from Montreal, and I can see a little bit of twining, twining screw job story here with him. The documentary crew. Ah, oh, man. And I gotta cir- quickly circle back to the men's realm before we switch. All right. Uh, Car- first off, Carlito, shredded, looking great. That 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 caught me by surprise. 
Uh, he's a little bit late because once he wasn't supposed to be for old school Raw, he was on all the vignettes. Then no, we're just he's not going to be there. Like that's not cool. Spitting an apple in a pandemic. Um, I love that Shinsuke just yanked it away. <laughs> and who else? Who else teared up for Edge and Christian's reunion? Anyone? Oh my god, that was great. That was amazing. And, and, and I don't think Edge shoot. I bet Edge shoot didn't know because Jay is just. Jay Christian is just that dick. <laughs> he's a, you see him just, he's all the, mat, like, I've been paying. If you close your eyes, he's giving a smirk when they have a hug. Oh, and it God. just so goes so well with, I'm doing retro Raws right now for Fretzelmania. And Edge and Christian right now are a prominent fixture. Uh, Rhino was about to debut for the company. That's, that's what I'll say. Damn. That is pretty awesome. Oh, man. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is now where we're going to be switching over from wrestling to pop culture stuff or just random topics that we want to talk about here. Uh, I do want to bring this up because I'm curious to know how your knowledge is when it comes down to this. Uh, all throughout the day, I've been watching a lot of – well, actually, for the last couple of days, I've watched a lot of classic movies from uh, HBO Max as well as uh, Disney+. Plus. I just recently rewatched Mrs. Doubtfire. Still a damn good yes. movie. That just is absolutely amazing. Uh, I watched the original That Darn Cat, not the 1999 remake version of it, because I saw a nostalgic tri- critic just destroy it. And I'm thinking to myself, if I watch this movie, am I going to have like the same anger-inducing field day with yes. this? With it? Because I look at it and I just see it just looks so ugly. It just does not look appealing at all. Whereas the original... I started getting into it. I'm like, okay, there's still some, okay, likable characters. Cats, you can kind of tell when they, they don't even need to say anything for a lot of these animals. They just have like the reactions timed perfectly or they were just trained very well. It just was amazing seeing that. Uh, some pretty good comedy spots that were in there. <laughs> Jeez Louise. Uh, the, the, t- the FBI agent that was allergic to cats, he he was likable. I liked him. Uh, and at least with the, you know, kidnappers, kidnapping the bank teller, I at least felt threatened with them. It's kind of one of those things where it's like, uh, they probably could kill this woman in like a matter of minutes. Or just do it now. It's just, whew, just, just freaky. Uh, another one that I got a chance to watch was uh, Billy Madison, which... Yes! I... I Here's some. Here's something I'm going to tell you, Fritz. Much like your opinion with Napoleon Dynamite, I don't know if this is going to get me some flack on it. I did research on it a little bit, and I saw like the Rotten Tomatoes scoring on it. I watched it with my dad, and both oh, of us, no. are, and both of us were kind of like, "What exactly is going on here?" So, okay, so he's going back to school for two weeks, and then later on, it's like, "Wait, is it? Dad, are dad, the two weeks?" Dad, in, I'm not the- <laughs> is is this two weeks? It's like, well, apparently, I think it's going to be two weeks for every grade. So he's literally going there for like six plus months or some something like this. This seems a little bit off, but okay. Um, <laughs> it's just kind of one of those things where I look at some of the highlights from it. Highlights there are probably anytime I see Norm Macdonald because love his cameo in Family Guy when he was the original Death. He was amazing. Oh, yes. <laughs> I, think you'd, I think you're going to have to make it worth my while if you catch my drift. What the hell are you doing? I, th- I was saying give me another fruit cup. Not bad, though. <laughs> Just, oh, my gosh. That's great. The original Weekend Update, the best Weekend Update guy, Norm MacDonald. Fight me on that. <laughs> um, Chris Farley, because he is a gem in <sighs> comedy. Uh, if you have not seen Tommy Boy, I definitely recommend it. That's a hilarious movie with him and David Spade. I oh, thought it's my they, favorite movie. Oh my gosh, I love I loved his you know brief stint in the <laughs> in in the movie where he's just this truck driver. <laughs> you know, where he's where he's the bu- uh, bus driver. Thank you. Damn bus around that'll end your precious little field trip. Pretty <laughs> damn quick. <laughs> That Veronica Vaughn <laughs> is one piece of ace. I know from experience, dude. No, I don't. Well, it's, a, it's a guy I know. You know <laughs> him and her. God, oh, hurry. No, they didn't. Yeah, but you can imagine what they like if they did. <laughs> eh? And of course, his um, it's like, 
1940. That is correct. Just, just. Take my <laughs> shit. You can see why Chris Farley is my all-time favorite actor, and that, that's the one, the one death to this day that took me the hardest Gosh. was Chris Far. He was supposed to be Shrek. I was just about to say, wouldn't that have been? amazing for him to be Shrek. Nothing against Mike Myers. He still did a really good job at it. Uh, I just kind of would like to have seen more of the Chris Farley version. I, I think he probably would have been propelled even higher as a comedy actor than he did, than he was already. Just would have been amazing. Or, or even a, this could have been like a serious role for him because he had mm. Coneheads, Wayne's World 1 and 2, like the, the hippie in Wayne's World, like He's gotten better, hasn't he? Way better. Uh, you know, Tell Me Boy Black Sheep, two of my favorite movies of all time. Billy Madison, another one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, and then there was Almost Heroes with um, Buddy from, I think it had one of the guys from Friends. And then Dirty Work with Norm MacDonald. And that was that was pretty much it for him. Like he was 28. Uh, don't do drugs, kids. Like my, my goodness, uh, but Billy Madison, like the, I could quote that movie for days because it's again, it's probably in my top five. Like what you just said was the most insanely idiotic thing <laughs> I've ever heard. It's like it never. It's like you know, it's like the, the like I wrote you no points and they got have mercy on your soul, <laughs> or you blew it. Uh, sometimes I feel like an idiot, but I am an idiot, so it kind of works out and. Low key, the most disgusting line in the whole movie. If peeing your pants is cool, consider me Miles Davis. Oh my gosh, yes. There, there were so many of those moments and so many of those lines where I was like, well, how did they get past censorship with all this kind of stuff? Oh, wait, I have to remember this is like 90s, so literally you could get away with certain. Yeah, you could get away with so much more with, with this stuff. Like, you know. I actually said, said, you know, remember when child abuse was used as comedy when Adam Sandler's just throwing dodgeball at like these kids? It's like, what? Oh man! <laughs> now you can't get you can't do that nowadays because people will frown on that. And they'll be like, oh, they're they're actually abusing kids, and parents should be ashamed of themselves. Like they know what they're getting their kids into. <laughs> Plus, they have good health insurance, so shut up. Um, and those actors are like sixteen, so. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so. I was not the biggest fan. It had its moments, but I think just the story kind of expanded a little bit more than it probably needed to. And also the fact that I think there was always so much of Adam Sandler that I could handle with that goofy voice. There just came a point where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm over it. Just, okay. Just, okay. We're good. We're good. We're good. Shut up. Oh God. <laughs> Chlorophyll, Borobach, Borophyll. No, I won't make out with you. We're trying to learn about chlorophyll here, and all she's consumed by is breaking out with me. And with the chlorophyll. Like, friggin' when he's in high school and he comes out of the car and the fucking winger shit. Oh my gosh. Lame. I, the, I, 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 I marked friggin- out with an Ario Speedwagon shirt. I thought that was awesome. I was like, yes, I know that band. Oh, Ario, right? No, Winger is Stuart from uh, Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> oh. and that's what he got, gave me vibes out of. But no, the the principal who ended up being the the masked event, like a wrestler or something. It's like, I heard that he killed a guy. He, I sat on him. He was supposed to pitch my butt if he was running to the one air. <laughs> and, and I told you, if... I would have loved to have some delicious Triscuit crackers. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm tr- sorry, doesn't put the Triscuit crackers in my mouth. Now, do they? I, <laughs> I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I might watch that movie tonight. Now, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the the movie I was try- I was trying to get get to was uh, a very old time classic movie um, from Japan that made it to the West Coast. The one of the old uh, Godzilla movies. It was the uh, Ghidorah three headed monster movie where it had Godzilla, Ghidorah. Rodan and uh, ba- Baby Mothra, because it wasn't like the full butterfly version of Mo- Mothra. I just remember looking at this, and the funny thing about this was that I found this under the horror section on HBO Max. HBO Max, what is wrong with you? Because I literally watched this, and there were so many points where I was just either getting bored 
or I just found myself almost on the ground laughing because there were some points where they had the, uh, I don't know if I would say the puppeteers, but like the costume designers and stuff like that. The costumes for uh, Rodan and Godzilla, they, they're, 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 it's a movie of its time. I'm going to say that right now. I'm definitely not going to knock it down and make it seem like, oh man, it's got crappy. Deal. No, this, they did with, they worked with what they got. I appreciate them for, for, for doing that. But it just literally felt like these guys, but like watching Godzilla and Rodan fighting was almost like watching like two pets fight, like two cats or two dogs. They're just kind of play fighting with each other. Uh, and then there's a point where uh, Mothra is basically say, saying, oh, stop fighting. We got to work together. And they, the Godzilla and Rodan are like, well, he's got to apologize first. No, he's got to apologize first. I'm like the hell are you talking about these monsters would not even be thinking about apologies they would just be trying to kill each other what is with this shit <laughs> i was so like blown out of report like what what is this and now i'm having i mean no offense to you know the classics but i have a more deeper appreciation for the godzilla movies that we have right now it's just one of those things where i watch it and why well, can watch the newer ones that came out and think okay Yep, nope, it's, C- it's CGI animated, but still I appreciate it. Um, I will also say this, I will take the special effects from the original Godzilla series over certain CGI movies that have come out. I'm just saying, I'm not going to name any because I'm not that petty, even though I was given the nickname Petty Guerrero by SoCal Val. Shout out to Val and God TV. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's just one of those things where, like I said, it's a movie of its time. I'm not going to lay waste to it. It's just one of those things where I think they had too much exhibition and not enough monster fighting because they made it all about like, oh, well, this princess is coming because she's getting assassinated. She needs the peace. And then she became this person from Venus, which honestly in and of itself, the fact that they literally have it be like, you know, it's a woman. She's talking like she came from Venus. I literally was just like, <clears throat> man, that would not hold up today because Men are from Mars. Women are no. from Venus. Oh wait, no, I'm thinking ECW. Never mind. <laughs> EC, uh, are, are you trying to do a, a Joel Gertner bit? Like Joel, I no, I'm not. I'm not finishing that one. <laughs> you no, know exactly. Literally, what I'm the about. only Godzilla movie I've ever seen is the one with Matthew Broderick uh, from like '97 because it has to this day one of my favorite movie soundtracks of all time. It's as I say, it's a thing of its time, but it's just where I was in life. You know, my uh, my co- uh, one of my cousins, uh, Laura, uh, she was a big, big fan of this soundtrack because you had you had the P Diddy remix of Cashmere by Led Zeppelin called "Come with Me." It was damn good. You had a remix of "Brain Stew" by Green Day, uh, Ben Folds Five, Everclear, uh, um, Silver Chair. I mean, this is a, who, a veritable who's who and who's that of 90s music. And I, I still rock that out once in a blue moon. And then I'll, then I'll text Laura and be like, hey, look at this. Uh, I imagine that CD is probably still at her parents' farm somewhere. Because <laughs> we were the shit out of that thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't hate God's, uh, Godzilla movies, but it's, a, it's the Matthew Broderick one. And it had all the... The, ta- the uh, Taco Bell commercials with the dog, like, Yo quiero Taco Bell, I think I need a bigger box, because he was trying to trap Godzilla. Uh, no. That's a lot of fish. No, that's a lot of shit. <laughs> there's, a, there's, a lot, there's a lot of shit talking here, jeez Louise. <laughs> it's all coming from Jurassic me. Park? I, oof, man. You know that big pot? No, no, no. The big pile of dinosaur poo. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> we're, yeah not, we're, not, we're not. We're not. Like we're not. We're not. About to say we're not. We're not saying that Jurassic Park's a big pile of shit. Although we could say that a couple of movies in the franchise are, but we're not going into that. That's for another. That's another topic for another day. Yeah. So that's kind of how it's been in my day. And I, before we even start recording, I watched a classic, uh, Uncle Buck, which, yes. in all honesty. I found it charming. I kind of, I kind of enjoyed it. It was one of those things where, you know, McCul- it features a very young Macaulay Culkin, probably before, maybe after he did the Home Alone movie, before. or same time, or just before. Yeah, around that time. So he was still like ridiculously adorable. <laughs> um, John Candy, who plays Uncle Buck, is just, all honesty, one of those guys I could see being 
a great dad. And also he did a tremendous uncle where he's just literally threatening the boyfriend of the eldest daughter. <laughs> oh my gosh. Where he just says like, I got a hatchet. No particular reason. I don't like to, you know, I'm not going to murder. I just like to maul. <laughs> just, it just pulls it out of his truck. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just, no, no, it wasn't maul. It was maim. There we go. That was the right M word. <laughs> Just, oh my gosh, it was just an absolutely great movie. I've been watching a lot of classic movies, and I've just been appreciating so many of them. It's just because of the fact that, you know, stories are easy to follow. Characters, they can either have, you know, likable qualities about them, or not that much likable qualities about them. I think that for the most part, the, you know, eldest daughter, she kind of was one of those people that I was like, man, I don't think she's going to have any redeemable qualities. And to this day, and even right now, I don't think she does. But it is kind of one of those things where finally she reached a point where she realized, you know, Uncle Buck was right and that she was just overreacting, that kind of deal. So it was kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, teenage girls can definitely harbor a lot of, you know, anger for a while. It's not until they see the truth that they realize that they're in the wrong and they do feel bad about it. So I'm going to let that one slide. So she was definitely one of those characters that at first I was like, oh, God, she's not going to grow on me, is she? But now it's like, no, she's just a misunderstood teen. It's, it is what it is. I work with teenagers. I get it. <laughs> I, I absolutely. I, I haven't seen Uncle Buck in so long, but I, I remember loving the movie because I, 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 John Candy and another one gone before his time. Just I can't, up here, he he's royalty in Canada. I mean, this dates back to his time on SCTV and if you don't know what that is uh, you're going to have to it's uh, skits Saturday Night Live mm. in Living Color that kind of stuff but that that was where like Rick Moranis and Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara all come from and, and if you like you know speaking of Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara I've been watching Shit's Creek and it is charming and hilarious and cringy all at the same time and it was filmed not too far from here so it's 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 another reason why everyone up here loves it so much. Uh, yeah, John Candy, just anything he does turns to gold. But Uncle Buck is one of them. One more movie I did forget to mention. Uh, I just watched American Reunion as well. Oh, which, dear God, no. Which, to be honest, it's another one of those movies that has its charm. It's definitely one of those movies that, you know, has more of like little quirky, funny moments more than anything. Especially at the end where you just see Stifler just... Just a big ray of sunshine, or just, just be like, I beg your, beg your mom. I was like, what, 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 what? No, nothing, nothing, nothing. Just those things where it's like, wow, this is a full circle moment right here because first movie, Finch had his way with Stiff for his mom. Now it's the other way around. Oh my God, this is really hilarious. <laughs> that is great full circle booking. And, uh, and the one chant, like, spoiler alert, kids. Uh, for a eight year old movie, and it's like you, you'd think that Nadia finally gonna get his have his chance with Jim, but Jim has been missing his private time with uh, with Lily. I mean, God, I call her Lily because of how I met your mother, uh, <laughs> Michelle. <laughs> uh, Michelle, and they have a um, a pretty vile, tender moment in the middle of a church. I think it was. And then there comes Nadia out of nowhere, like, mm. yeah. And, oh, and the laptop getting slammed on his junk. I mean, that was gross. Oh gosh. Stif- Stifler taking a taking a dump in the cooler was freaking hilarious. <laughs> it was kind of one of those things where it's like, is it high school? Yes. Is it still hilarious? You bet your ass it is. <laughs> it's just one of those th- things where I I actually forgot about Nadia until she appeared. Uh, and I'm just, she's like, Hello. it's like, hi, Jim. It's like, Nadia? I'm like, oh, shit, that's right. They were a, th- they were a thing for a while. Oh, my gosh. You just, she just comes out of nowhere with this little, with this smaller man, which I assume was going to be like boyfriend, maybe husband. Who knows at this point? But it's still one of those things where it's like, oh, shit, that's that's funny. And, he, and even he's just kind of kind of like, Way to go, bud. <laughs> it's the first time meeting him. It's like, nice job. <laughs> well, she did bang the Shermanator, too. That is true. That is true. Also, the Shermanator likes chubbies, but that's a different story. <laughs> hey, 
Hey, to each their own, man. Uh, I'm not wanting to king shame. <laughs> All right. So one thing you definitely were wanting to talk about when it came, came out to it when we did this episode, you wanted us to talk about this, and I'm looking forward to talking about it anyway. WandaVision. Five episodes have already come out. Your thoughts, my good sir. <laughs> okay. I honestly didn't know what to think. Like, I I was going to get to watching it eventually until I, like, oh, I'm going to put this off later. Is this like a season show? Oh, I can binge it when I have time. No, it's new episodes every week, and I'll see memes all over Instagram and Facebook if I don't watch it. Uh, I'll have the credit, uh, our, our buddy Quarantine Gene Wade, uh, Big Heck and Wade Adventures, uh, to <laughs> hashtag Wade Cares. And if you watch uh, G.O.W. on Game of Ant, oh, I forget what his thing does with the subs, Generous Wade or something. Anyways, <laughs> kind of been egging me on, not personally, but by seeing his memes to watch it. First, I'm like, okay, this is an episode of Andy Griffith and Leave it to Beaver. You had the black and white. You had the cheery, happy-go-lucky, sitcom-y feel. And eventually you go through the years. And I was getting all these references. They were referencing things like I Love Lucy, Leave it to Beaver, Andy Griffith, The Brady Bunch, The Monkees. When they did that friggin' Family Ties intro, at episode, I think it was episode five, you know, the paintbrush part? Yeah. I lost my shit. And then they go right into a Growing pain style intro. I was, you know, expecting, show me that smile again. Just hearing that <laughs> theme again. Oh, man. Who's who's the guy from, who's the dad from Growing Pains? Uh, God rest that guy's soul. I was, um, the less you say about Kirk Cameron, the better. But now that I'm starting to get what might be going on here, uh, we're heading into the spoiler room brawl a little bit here, kids. But I'm thinking House of M, because in House of M, you see that, you think that this is concocted com- completely by Wanda, by uh, by Scarlet Witch here. And I'm, I see a little bit of somewhere in the MCU, because did you see she had a little bit of a, a vision, a vision, well, pun intended, but it's when he was missing the, the stone in his head after Thanos ripped it out. And then all of a sudden he's back to himself. So... This is grief-stricken Wanda trying to concoct her life or the life that she would have pictured with Vision had he not perished. But here's the thing. You see, if you pay attention to the MCU, he has died twice. I, I believe he was snapped. No, no, he wasn't snapped because the, the last stone was taken out of him. But somewhere in there, he's died twice. And is she trying to resurrect him? Is she trying to turn this into a weapon? Because in House of M, and the comics House of M, she goes bat crap crazy with this whole concocting of this vision of a better life and also is used as kind of a weapon. So once I saw Sword get involved here, and by the way, casting of the new girl as that lead of Nerdy Chick lead, awesome. And uh, Mr. Wu from the Spider-Man PS1 ga- uh, 4 game and also from Off the Boat. Great casting, by the way. Uh, I'm just so intrigued. And the fact that we saw someone from Wanda's Pass, spoiler room brawl in three, two, one. her brother Quicksilver, who did he not die in one of the MCU or X Men movies too? Uh, who knows? Uh, so if if they're going to go House of M, I'm all for it. If they're going to do like this alternate reality, it's it's hard to describe and talk about, but it's just so damn intriguing. Like your jaws drop the whole time. Like I saw everyone's reactions from uh, the fourth wall guys. They, they just have, like, a big jaw-dropping moment. I put mine out there, like, wow. Uh, <laughs> Nate, what are your <laughs> thoughts, bro? Honestly, at first I didn't know what to think because, as you kind of said before, it just started off kind of like classic, kind of classy television deal. As time goes on, you kind of see it having more layers added on, other characters added on. One thing I did love was that they added one of the scientists – 
from the Thor series. She came in and I was just like, yes, yes. Why can't I remember her name? But at the same time, yes, I remember her. She was awesome. And she's awesome in this series too. I love it. It's just one of those things where it's like they're incorporating different deals here. They they mentioned the whole blip. They literally showed people reappearing from the snap. And all I thought to myself was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing because they're doing this kind of stuff. They are literally trying to make sure that everything threads together, not only with, you know, with everything that went on with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but it makes sense within the entirety of the Marvel Universe fully. I mean, I don't even know what we can even call it now because this is going far beyond cinema. This is like the Marvel screen universe or the Marvel, you know, picture universe. Streaming universe. You know what? Maybe it is. Maybe it is going to be the MSU. And it's streamlined here, so, huh? There we go. <laughs> the MS- oh, my gosh. So much stuff. Disney, we probably will not trademark this, but we came up with the idea, so at least give us something. Maybe, like, free one-year passes to Disney World, Disneyland, whatever. Both. We'll do both. Borders closed. That won't help me. Uh, just <laughs> uh, just give me Disney Plus for free. There we go. Because I share it with, like, uh, with... Dave and the kids and my neighbor and another one of my coworkers. Yeah, there we go. So I think that that's our fair price, Disney. Free, free, free unlimited passes for me and Disney Plus unlimited free for him. So that's just, that's our price. But yeah, this is really one of those series where it is showing a darker side of Wanda, which I think is really great to see. I mean, the fact that they showed, like you said, the deal where... It shows Vision when he got the gem taken out of his head. That was one of those things. Was like, oh God, they're they're going down this route. This is uh that's that was scarring even for me as an adult. That is not something I didn't think I would see. Then here, finding out, oh yeah, she stole his body. I'm like, oh God, they're going dark on this. This is even this is even darker than I thought it was going to be. Why no? Just and even they're show, they have Vision, you know, question everything that's going on. I was like. Don't you think that people are going to notice that our kids are, like, growing up so much faster than what they should be? Don't you think that people are acting weird around here and Wanda's just being, like, Vision, it's fine. You're just oh, you're just tired and blah, blah, blah. It's like, and Vision is just like, uh, I'm a computer. Therefore, I can, I don't have to worry about sleep. So, something is not right and you're not telling me the full story here. So, it's one of those things where it's like, Vision's mind is still there. She still loves her. But he also knows that there's something is wrong. He's starting to suspect some things, and the kids growing up. Uh, He's becoming sentient. <laughs> that, yeah, uh, Nate, have you, uh, have you are you familiar with Futurama? Of course. Well, there, there's an episode. Uh, I forget which. I think it's called "Time Keeps on Skipping" or "Slipping." And uh, the Planet Express crew are out in space to gather these little particle things. However. They create a rift, which just gets time going like, phew. So it, it goes like a kind of like a Scrubs or How I Met Your Mother cutaway. Like, bloop. it'd be like uh, the the year 3000's version of Britney Spears. Let's just call it, you know, Britney 2.0. It's like, and Britney 2.0 is pulling up in a music scene, bloop, won three, three Grammys, bloop, found dead in her bathroom. So I'm getting... I've got big time Planet Express fights. I, I forgot for a second that Wanda stole the body, so that goes in with my reanimation theory here a little bit. And episode five comes out on Friday, so uh, actually, so does Super Mario 3D All Stars and Bowser's Fury for the Switch. So that's my well, my day plan before I go to work. <laughs> um, <laughs> man. Uh, and now that I've got my neighbor, my, my neighbor who's also my coworker, now that I got Owen into it, uh, it's uh, gives me something to talk about to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. It's, as I said, it's hard to describe, but I think once we see the big picture, it'll probably be way off from what we've been talking about, oh or pretty close. Uh, I just want to see it pay off. I just want to see it unravel. And the kept and we got Captain America, the, the Winter Soldier Falcon series coming out as well. And I thought it, there's a rumor. I don't know if it's true, but there was this big meme on Facebook 
that Futurama could be coming to Disney Plus. If that's the case, uh, you won't see me for days. <laughs> Fair enough. I I found out an HBO series that they've got um, Game of Thrones. They also have the uh, Friends episodes on there. I think there was one other series I was looking at, but maybe, maybe How I Met Your Mother is on there as well. I'd have to I'd have to look deeper well, into it, but I know that there was like a lot. Watch line. it. Avoid. Um, I said, what's the whole thing for the experience? But season nine, I love the finale, but season nine sucked. Oh, of Game of Thrones. No, um, How I Met Your Mother. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. It, it's kind of one of those things where it's. So this is also going to go into one other, one other thing before we kind of wrap this up. And I was going to do this as a separate episode, but I'm also going to do this. But I'm just going to do this on this episode. So I watched the spinoff series of Once Upon a Time, which was Once Upon a Time in Wonderland, which kind of had the series based more on uh, Alice battling against this, uh, th- like the Red Queen, but not the Queen of Hearts. Why the hell not at this point? I don't know. Um and the series itself is passable, maybe, I would say. I just had a hard time getting behind the characters. Some of them were just not that likable. I was literally thinking to myself, man, I would much rather have the actress that paid Alice in the uh, <laughs> in the final season of uh, Once Upon a Time over this Alice. Not that she's a bad actress, it's just her character morals are just weird and just it's just i don't understand her entirely just it's really just absolutely far out it's kind of one of those things where you watch the series and you think to yourself okay you're kind of running out of ideas and you definitely do see stuff just trickling down and you couldn't get some of the actors from the original to come in even though they got spoilers they got robin hood cora um oh gosh i thought they had one more person in there that i was familiar with uh, oh, also the one of the the oh gosh, who was it again? What one of the like hunt, one of the thieves from Robin's gang involved in there as well? But it was just one of those things. Where little it was John? Like, oh, it was not Little John. It was definitely not. Um, Fire Chuck? <laughs> nope, it was not Fire Chuck either. It was just some random person that was just in there. <laughs> um, so yeah, like I said, so many of these characters, I was just kind of like, eh, it. it, it okay but don't care really um it's just such a far out season once upon a time wonderland is definitely not worth the watch not one of my favorite series it's just it just it's just very hard to kind of enjoy because you had so much expectations when seeing the original once upon a time and then as soon as you're done with it it's just kind of like well what are we gonna do next okay once upon a time wonderland this should be fun nope not not as fun as what it was before. I mean, they try doing like the same things that they did where they have, you know, a mixture of reality as well as the fiction, which is fine. I'm fine with that. It just need to have everything make sense as well as be enjoyable to watch, which sadly, this was not one of them. They also featured Whoopi Goldberg as a bunny. Because why not at this point? They couldn't get Whoopi Goldberg in a better, better role, I guess. Um, so yeah, that's my review on Once Upon a Time in Wonderland. It was, it was okay. It just not something I would really say. Hey, go watch. Go out of your way and watch it. It's not worth it. First six seasons of Once Upon a Time, they're worth it. Seven, if you want to see kind of things just kind of tie up and just certain things get like wrapped up, it's fine, but it's unnecessary. One through six is definitely the way the way to go. You definitely just see as time goes on. And you, you could probably relate to this too, Fretz, where series are definitely trying to think of ideas, but as soon as they start running out of ideas, it makes so much less sense that they would do this. <laughs> Guess. It's yep. just like... You, they, you, they have their jump the shark moment, and then it just falls off the wagon. Like, you're, if you go through How I Met Your Mother, spoiler alert, you're going to experience that. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think for me that jumping off of the boat moment for me uh, with Family Guy was probably the episode where they killed off Brian. And then weeks later... Oh, it was way before that for me. And then, and then I think... <laughs> then weeks later, oh, they brought him back. It's like, oh, just... No. Just no. 
I mean, it's still an emotional moment. And every single time I see it, I always swell up with tears because it just is something where, you know, he is a very likable character if you kind of get past some of his faults. But he's still one of those characters where you just kind of feel, you kind of feel bad for the guy. But, yeah, that was kind of it. <laughs> that was kind of those moments for me. Anyway, I'm kind of ranting on about this on and on. Uh, definitely, guys, check me out on Twitter at Real Life and Game. Check me check out the Fate Game Changer podcast on all different podcasting formats. Doing this right away because Mr. Fretz, the floor is going to be yours when it comes to plugs and such like that. I know that you have so much to plug because you are part of a network after all. <laughs> yes, that is that is right. That is. Uh... Our old friends at Wrestle Addict Radio follow us on Twitter at Addict underscore Wrestle. Uh, we're also on Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, just just about everywhere. I think if you, if you look up Wrestle Addict Radio, you'll find you'll find us you'll find us there. Uh, podcasting platforms anywhere from Amazon Music to Zoom. If anyone actually uses Zoom, I want to I want to know seriously. Me on Twitter and Instagram at Fretzelmania. It's F R E T Z L E Mania. My podcast, Fretzelmania Podcast, where I do a bit of retro, a little bit of current, is every Saturday on Wrestle Addict Radio. I've been going through two thousand one Monday Night Raws lately. Uh, my my goal is to go through the uh, the invasion angle. And as long as I still have the network, because, you know, y'all decide to sell it to a bunch of birds down there, uh, <laughs> hopefully it still works for me in Canada. Uh, oddly enough, when I signed up for it, I had to create a U.S. address so I could use it in my browser. So the browser, the account thinks I'm in Beverly Hills, <laughs> but course. my Internet's in Canada. So if that doesn't work, I'm effed. Uh uh, we also have a Patreon page for those who are interested. Five bucks a month, no tears, straight up. You get exclusive shows such as Francis Fay Five. When I'm able to, not every week, I do a monthly pop culture and wrestling show, the Twenty Bell Salute. Uh, I'm going to try and do that the end, the last Sunday of every month. Uh, like I just did Royal Rumble 2001 which included one of my favorite movies ever, Super Troopers. Uh, it included one of my least favorite movies ever, Save the Last Dance, uh, and then a watch-along of the Royal Rumble match. That show caps at two and a half hours, and that's like uh, early days of you and me podcasting <laughs> amounts of time here, Nate. Uh, what do I got? Yeah, I got Russell Attic Radio. Uh, the rest of us, you know, um, we have the Kings of the Rings podcast, uh, Mr. YLP, the Young Lions Perspective, does two shows a week now. And although, you know, he's uh, he's on a break right now, you know, uh, good, our good brother Mance, is, uh, he's had a rough little while, a uh, couple of passings in the family, as we all know. So I uh, just want to send our love to, to Mance, uh, just, in, just until, you know, think, uh, you know, think things get better for him wise, it's. It's there, and let's see, Russell. Yeah, that's that's all right there. So, hey, if you want to become a Patreon, five bucks a month, you get access to our uh, exclusive shows and a great group chat with a bunch of great people, and Russell Attic Radio, the Cure for the Common Wrestling Podcast, where great, great, <laughs> cool stuff goes down. There's yeah. my plugs. There we go. Definitely. Oh, uh, one thing I definitely do want to make mention is that for those that are in the uh, central Wisconsin area as well as over by the Green Bay area, definitely a couple of big events that are going to be coming into the area in in, in just the next couple of months. Jeez Louise. Um, got Water City Wrestling Con that's going to be taking place in April. They actually moved that from the, I think it was the 10th to the 17th now for that for that weekend because they didn't want to combat with wrestlemania understandably so um so many great talent have already been signed on there uh matt cardona kurt hawkins kevin nash uh Tenille dashwoods the boogeyman icp are going to be there and honestly i could see so oh, many geez. others <laughs> so many other great people that are going to be involved with that so definitely get your tickets for that go to acw wrestling uh acw wisconsin.com apologies See how you can be a part of that. And I do know that the Game Changer Podcast will be a proud sponsor of that event because 
Love ACW. Has always been great. Uh, another big event that's going to be actually coming in Stevens Point is going to be the rescheduled, I believe they're calling it Honor Bound, if I'm not mistaken, put on by Frontline Pro. Main thing you can expect from this is a big-time matchup between Bulletproof Ben McCoy and the whole effing show himself, Rob Van Dam. So that is going to be absolutely amazing to be a part and to sponsor that show as well. Uh, for those of you that want to continue to see me in my road to being a wrestler, definitely check out The Wrestling Show as well as Notebook Entertainment. They are a great group of people from the from the Rockford area in which The Wrestling Show has been creating matches for years now. They're already on their sixth season right now. It looks to be wrapping up within the next couple months I want to see and season seven is definitely going to be very promising notebook entertainment is having the heavily uh, critically acclaimed uh, fml series where basically you just have those f my life moments great comedy sketches great stuff there uh, they also have done a lot of great stuff like the Dettersons and a couple of other horror movie related de- deals when they're not working on comedy so definitely check them out as well oh gosh I'm trying to think if there was anybody else that I needed to plug on this. I think other than that, that should be it. I plugged ACW, I plugged Frontline Pro, Wrestling Show, Notebook Entertainment, people that I worked with. Honestly, guys, been working with a lot of people ever since leaving WrestleAtic Radio, but I will say this, that if all goes well, you can definitely expect WrestleAtic Radio and Game Changer Podcast to be working in the future. Is it a spoiler? Possibly. Or am I just putting that out there who knows maybe i'm just playing the paul Heyman card at this moment i'm (laughs) excuse me so mr frets thank you so much for gracing us with your presence here take a time out of your wrestling radio schedule to be a part it's always great to have you back man looking forward to having you back on the show uh, yeah, let's uh, let's bank for WrestleMania season, bro. Hells yeah, we're definitely going to be banking on that. So you can expect that during WrestleMania season, guys, that Fretzelmania will be back. Put that as an end credit sequence right here. Oh, wait, this is a podcast, so we can't do that. Damn it. I'll put it in the description. And this, and this is my Tommaso Ciampa running you into the thing moment. <laughs> I, I thought As the credits roll. I, I thought it was going to be like a Tommaso, Tommaso Ciampa, like waving with Goldie deal, or just the pat on the back deal. <laughs> oh my gosh, Tommaso Ciampa, you have graced us with re- your wrestling deal. Also, never leave NXT. Oh, he's not going to leave NXT. Good because he is a star there. So for Mr. Fretz, I've been Nate the Effing Great. This has been the Game Changer Podcast, reminding you guys: stay safe, be respectful. Be smart, wear a mask, and also remember that you can make a difference one day at a time. How can you do that? By being a game changer. Thank you guys so much. See ya. Stop looking at me, Swan. <laughs>